Well, this year we saw the challenges of a pandemic and we heard the cry for social justice. And recently we reported the experience of an interracial couple trying to refinance their home who got what they considered an extremely low appraisal when they changed their interior decorations from Afrocentric to European. Their appraisal jumped by 40%. So it made us ask, what is the relationship between race and real estate? There is a wealth gap between blacks and whites tied to home ownership, and there's a history of home ownership made difficult through a practice known as redlining, in which banks refuse to make loans to black people in certain neighborhoods. Where you live today determines the quality of your kids' schools, your family's health, even your relationship with police. Redlining is now illegal, but as On Your Side's Ken Amaro reports, its legacy continues to shape life in some communities to this day. And houses all down here. To understand the legacy of redlining, still doesn't have You have to see it. So we moved in 1959. See it from up high. We were the first black family on Stockton Street. See it from street level. You were living on the other side of the track. That's right. You have to see it through the eyes of those who experienced it. Taylor, two cities in Jacksonville. We had a large apartment complex on this vacant property up here. Warren Jones, husband, side. father, grandfather, former city councilman, and now school board member. We had houses here. Has seen it from every angle. We now know why we were limited to where we could live. Redlining maps were created in 1933 by a federal home loan agency, marking in red ink areas where the government would not lend money. Those maps labeled black neighborhoods as hazardous. They created zones where home ownership and the generational wealth that's created by owning property was all but impossible. A lot of people recognize that they could not get housing and loans like the majority of citizens could, but they didn't understand what was causing it. Redlining was banned with the 1968 Fair Housing Act. However, its legacy or consequences were left behind. You have neighborhoods that are still struggling. When Jones and his family moved from a rental in La Villa to Stockton Street, two blocks from Mixon Town, they moved behind the invisible fence of racial segregation. And I had to come to Forest Park because that was the school system was segregated. It was a neighborhood school in a red-lined community built near environmental hazards. Forest Park was built in the same block as the incinerator that burnt all the garbage in Jacksonville. In the same block that they had the dog pound where they killed the dogs. Joan says also in the same block, a slaughterhouse. Where they slaughtered hogs and pigs and cows and only a few blocks from the place where they slaughtered the, the chicken. Jones says the children played in two open areas near McCoy's Creek. At the time, a cesspool of human and animal waste. That creek at the time was the sewer line for the west side of town. The church now owns that property. We went back 60 years to the neighborhood where Jones grew up to see the legacy of redlining down this street, uh, in the street in this neighborhood. There's no infrastructure, there's no curb and gutters, there are very few sidewalks. A number of homes have since been demolished. Many of the environmental hazards are now gone. And while those who were able to move have moved, the community remains plagued by poverty, crime, and illness. Home ownership is the key to growing wealth. And unfortunately, many people in this community did not have that advantage. Studies have shown almost all red line neighborhoods are worse off today. In some, the life expectancy is nearly 20 years less than residents of affluent neighborhoods. What will it take to erase the vestiges of red lining in predominantly black neighborhoods? But there are many neighborhoods that have been left behind. Having seen it from every perspective, Joan says first, there has to be a commitment to these communities along with an investment. And we need to redouble our efforts to make sure 
that we invest in those old neighborhoods to make sure that people can be uplifted and feel proud of, of those neighborhoods and be willing to invest in those neighborhoods going forward. Ken Amaro, it's not an easy topic, but we appreciate your work on that. And we want you to know that our On Your Side team has spent weeks digging into the legacy of race in real estate. Tonight at 11, we look at how the earliest city zoning maps chose to put polluting industries into black neighborhoods. And tomorrow at 6, we explore both the financial and also the psychological toll of racial bias in real estate. One home two very different real estate appraisals and a stark divide between black and white. This family's Ortega home jumped in value by 40% after they removed all signs of black culture from inside. They say this is living proof that people of color face a substantial wealth gap. All your size, Troy Kless joins us live tonight with their story. Well, thank you. The family says that this home here to my right was initially valued at a price far below their expectations and far lower than other homes in this neighborhood. So they did an experiment and they say the result demonstrates the literal cost of racial bias. The Ortega area with lush houses everywhere. Abena and Alex Horton say they wanted to refinance their mortgage. They say their first appraisal did not go well, far lower than their neighbors. What's what's wrong? It's like, well, it's way under, you know, um, this is this is just weird. So we're going to order another one. And, you know, I obviously had a bunch of questions. The bank scheduled a second appraisal. Horton made some interior changes. So I thought that most likely it would make a difference if I took down um, the family pictures that we had in the home and, you know, basically any markers that there were African-Americans living in the house. The difference between the first and second appraisal, $135,000. Experience, and we just felt that, you know, maybe it was outright incompetence, but it seemed like targeted incompetence, and yeah. it seemed like incompetence that to us was suspicious. She is filing a complaint with HUD to see if there was a systematic undervaluing of her home. Horton says racial discrimination in housing has been under the table for far too long. But I do think that if there is unconscious bias in the world, it's going to seep into the appraisal business and it's going to impact black wealth and black generational wealth. For the last few days, we've been exploring Jacksonville's legacy of race and real estate. Our series was inspired by the story of an Ortega couple whose home appraisal jumped 40 percent after they cleared their house of all signs of, quote, blackness, as they put it. The response to that story was just enormous. And while bias in real estate isn't new, this time it came with a price tag. And the actual dollar amount managed to transform something often invisible into something undeniable. In this third installment of our series, On Your Sides and Schindler reports that this kind of transactional prejudice takes a financial toll, toll and a psychological one too. Yeah, racism is heartbreaking. It was just uh, a kind of an understood process to get the house on the market. When Topher Sanders made the move from Jacksonville to New Jersey, it was his first time selling a home, but he approached it with a veteran's cynicism. One of the things you want to do is to de-blackify your house and that you want to scrub your house for blackness. In some ways, this was a simple process of elimination. We actually created a, a little bin that we could throw stuff into. But it wasn't always simple. My wife is a graduate of Cornell University. She worked very hard for that degree. And my wife is Nigerian. She has a Nigerian name. So we took down her Cornell uh, University diploma. You're being too sensitive. Everything's not about race, you know. A Jacksonville realtor we're calling Chantal says her white acquaintances sometimes react to the bias she encounters as if it were an isolated experience. Um, someone likened it to a bee sting. One bee sting, two bee stings, okay, that that just happened, but when there's just constant bee stings, like all the time, it just gets to the point where you're, you know, you can't think about it. You have to like try to put it out of your mind so that you don't stay angry all the time. Chantal has had police run her license and that of her black client while showing a $600,000 home. 
She's seen slam dunk sales go sour when agents forward her email, which includes a signature block with her picture. And she's seen her own behavior change in an effort to minimize the racism of others. I, I there's this, maybe even a, an unconscious or subconscious on a subconscious level where I'm making sure that I speak properly and I'm making sure that I'm, I'm extremely polite so that, so that I, I'm not, treated like less than a person. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't, <laughs> this didn't mean to get emotional there, but, um, but it, it just, it grates on you. These are the ways that black and brown people every day in this country look to mitigate racism. We want to avoid it at all costs. For Topher Sanders, prejudice demands a certain kind of pragmatism. It's not about running away from who you are or being Black, proud of being Black. Um, I don't want uh, my family's Blackness to get in the way of selling the home for what it should. It's a complicated reality, he says, with a straightforward solution. Just wish people weren't racist. <laughs> that would make uh, uh, selling a home as a Black or brown person uh, significantly easier. Ann Schindler, First Coast News, on your side.